Welcome, welcome, welcome world to the Black Psychologist Podcast. We are here. Appreciate everyone being here and joining us on this here lovely platform. You could be anywhere in the world, but you're here with us. We appreciate that. As always, I am Dr. Kyle Osborne. He is I and I am him. And you all know I'm never here by myself. Of course not. I'm here with the one and only. He's slow motion with the potion, trying to get to the ocean. My guy, Dr. Jason Coleman. What's going on, good brother? What's good, bro? I'm slow motion with this camera right now. I'm trying to get right. What's good, though? You all right? I'm cool. I'm cool. See, everybody, this is what this is. This is real time, all right? This is how we keep it 100%. <laughs> it's authentic, okay? Techni you know, technical difficulties or no technical difficulties, we are here for the people. That's how we roll. That's right. All That's right. right. You're going to get it done, all right? We, you're going to get <laughs> educated, and you're going to get real live, in the moment, troubleshooting with technical difficulties. Yeah. This is <laughs> of course, man, you know, I'm, I'm going to always, you know, give you that peek behind the curtain, but, you know, um, for real, for real, just want to thank everybody for tuning in again. Um, just want to encourage everybody to hit the subscribe button. Um, we want to thank everybody for taking the time to listen. Um, all the comments we get, you know, the likes, um, all of that support, we appreciate it. So um, just want to encourage anybody who has it to hit the subscribe button and, you know, we're going to get into it. Yes, sir. Yeah, share it. Uh, subscribe, comment. We appreciate We appreciate the love as well as the hate. All right. We've been seeing a couple <laughs> comments out there, some trolling. We love it. All right. As you know, Dr. J and I do not discriminate. OK, so as long as you're watching, we love it. All right. So thumbs up, thumbs down, whatever the situation is, just watch it and share. All right. Spread the word. We appreciate all the love. All right. We got a lot to get to because a lot of people have been acting up, Jay. I'm not sure what's going on. I know with the summer, you know, the uh, the foolishness and maladaptive behavior tends to go up. Um, so it's a lot to get to. So first and foremost, Sesame Place, man. Ah. Sesame Place apparently is not the same as it used to be. All right. So a lot of Sesame Place has been in the news recently. Um as it took place a couple weeks ago, uh, there was a mascot or one of the uh, Sesame Place characters, uh, Rosita, I believe that is. Yeah. Rosita uh, refused to give high fives to two young African-American girls uh, at the theme park. So what took place, uh, you had these two, he had an he African-American family, uh, I believe it was a mom and the aunt, along with the two young African-American girls. Um, so those of you that haven't been to Sesame Place, they have a parade, right? So they have a parade usually along with like the theme park and the rides, but there's usually like a time period, like in the middle of the park or like their main drive or whatever they call it. And they have like a, um, a parade that all the characters are, are there. Cookie Monster, Elmo, um, Big Bird, everybody's in it. They're rolling out and you get the chance to, they, they come up to the, all the kids, they high five, they give hugs, all these other different things. It's a beautiful, uh, typically it's, it's a great interaction for the kids and the parents to be able to see the, your favorite character up close. So apparently on this particular Saturday afternoon, uh, during the parade route, Rosita uh, saw two girls, the two girls I just mentioned, were approaching. So they walked up to the character uh, to give two high fives, but the mascot waved them away. When I mean like it wasn't um, like it wasn't covert, it wasn't discreet, it was and kept kept the move. It didn't break stride. She had just given somebody else a high five or something and did mm -mm -mm -mm, and then kept them moving. And immediately the little girls look back because uh, for the reason that they were disheartened, um, you could see that there was, you know, vividly, they, they were affected by uh, the reaction. And so it was claimed that, uh, and mind you, the whole thing was recorded. The whole thing right. was recorded by the, by the mom and, or, and the aunt. And apparently Rosita, the mascot, 
uh, hugged a little white girl that had been standing next to the family. And there was a video that came out later on with that right. from a different view. So, um, and so along with that video, there was other examples as well of Sesame Street staff um, that were having some questionable behavior also going on over there. So um, the mom or the family raised immediately attempted to raise the issue with the Sesame Place staff immediately after the incident, um, but her complaints were not taken seriously. Uh, I know it was met with a lot of different uh, excuses. They said that the mascot didn't see the kids and so on and so forth, all these other different um, terrible excuses that they gave. So eventually, of course, once the video went viral um, and it started making the headlines and started making its rounds on the news and places, then of course, Sesame Place released a, um, an apology and they vowed to conduct employee bias training, uh, training and such, and said they're going to uphold the commitment for an inclusive park experience. All right. So uh, they said, to be clear, what the two young girls experienced, what the family experienced is unacceptable. It happened in our park with our team. We own them. It is our responsibility to make this better for the children and family to be better for all families. That was the um, their, their statement that they put out. Um, Jay, this is for me just kind of like immediately going back to when I had, you know, took my little one um, to Sesame Place. And it real. I immediately had a reaction um, for the reason that this is the worst thing that you want to happen for with your kid. You know, you you take your kid there. It's a hot day, right? It's during the summer. To, you're taking them there to have fun, right? You're taking them there to go to the, the water park, see their favorite character that they are watching day in and day out on the computer, on the tablet, or they see them on on TV. And it's supposed to be a good time. Like it's supposed to be lighthearted. It's supposed to be a great moment. And unfortunately for these two, two little girls, the world became very real for them, right? It, it's, this is not the manner in which any parent wants to have this conversation about race, right? This is not the way this is supposed to happen for now this parent has to deal with this situation. And immediately like if you watch the video you see the two little girls they they look disheartened like it, you saw like their whole world shattered because when he did this and just kept them moving they look back at their at their mom or, or their aunt and they were like vividly upset i mean it was like visibly they were so saddened by the situation and like this just disheartens you as a parent, it, frustra it frustrates you as a parent. Like there are a whole range of emotions that I can imagine um, that these, the, that their parents or their caretakers were experiencing. And uh, then just to add more insult to the situation is when the aunts attempted to address the, you know, the situation or the, or the issue, Sesame Place minimized it, tried to absolve their character of any wrongdoing and so on and so forth right as opposed to immediately going into you know customer service recovery and being like oh well we have to resolve the issue we're gonna nope excuses and just completely glossed over the situation and then it had to get to a point where um it started making its rounds on social media and in the news outlets and things of that nature um but you know my heart goes out for the little kids um because for the reason that this doesn't and it shouldn't have happened, right? This shouldn't happen in an event where you're just trying to see your favorite characters on TV. And now the world has gotten that much more real for them. And now these parents have to have that conversation. So uh, that was just my initial uh, reaction. Mm -hmm. How about for you? Uh, I mean, listen, this is funny because it kind of came back up. Like I had seen this article like a couple, I want to say like a week or so ago. Cause this story was kind of like it's been developing for a little while um and initially when i saw it i kind of didn't pay too much attention to it because you know i'm like i'm like all right it's, it's a lot of factors you know probably going on um but then you know then they, and i and i didn't really know what to think to be honest with you i didn't think it was a good thing you know what i mean um but you know you see clips and stuff you know and you don't really know the backstory 
But then when they issued the apology, then I kind of started reading up on it a little bit, right? Um, so they got to own it because they issued an apology, right? Um, it's just rough though, right? Because again, I'm not disagreeing with you. You know, it looks bad, right? Because when you look at the video, you know, again, whether it is inside the costume, he or she kind of like waved off the kids and then you kind of see them in another frame embracing other kids, right? Um, so it looks bad, but like I was talking to you before, like earlier, I don't know if they've even identified the person inside the suit, right? So we don't know whether they're young, whether they're old, whether they're black, whether they're white, whether they're not. So I can't really say like, okay, it's definitely racist. You know what I'm saying? I'm not gonna say it's not, you know, you understand, but those things obviously matter, right? Because if we find out that it's a young African-American kid in there, then he becomes a jerk and not a racist, you know what I'm saying? So I don't know. Um, so I'm not going to necessarily rush the judgment on that. I'm not saying you are, you know. Um, it definitely looks like a duck and it's walking like one, you know. Um, so, but I think more of the focus from me would kind of be on and we'll touch on this a little in a little different context later, but like Sesame Place is supposed to be like a, 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 a safe place, right? So you would think everybody is on their best behavior. Parents, you know, he's a little bit more patient, right? You know, um, uh, uh, kids, you know, everybody's going to be happy that day. And you would think including with that, you know, the characters know that whether they're at a, a, a parade or you know, they're in a plaza, you gotta take a little bit more time than you might have to, so you can talk to every kid, as many as possible, because you're making their day, right? Um, so I think my focus is more on that, like the rejection that they felt, no matter who was under there, you know what I mean? Um, because these is, face it, these are two little girls that were very excited when they walked up there, you know what I mean? So um, I think we've all been in a situation with a little one where, We've been in a rush to go somewhere. And of course, this is a different situation, right? And But, but they wanted to either show you something or do something that was exciting to them, right? So um, I think just that disappointment is kind of what I focused on more. I'm sure all of this other stuff will come out in terms of who was in the suit and what they're going to train their employees on. But, you know, they started talking about 20 more families had similar complaints, right? So it's starting to look like a pattern, right? Um, so again, you know, they're hanging on by a thread because I, I don't have x-ray vision and I can't see through the suit and know that it's the same person every time. But, you know, again, we're starting to, it's starting to smell like fire, it's starting to smell smoke and see it, man, you know? And I so think that I'm not going to say too much about it, but it's, you know, it's just disappointing. I think that's a key ingredient is that um, one, this is just the reported or the incident caught on, on camera, right? Or caught on the phone. Right. So like you mentioned, there have been other or maybe similar incidents that are now going to start to come to light. Because you you know and I know it only takes one incident to get caught for everyone else to be like, oh, yeah, I, this was taking place and this was my issue. And then right. other different right. things start to leak with complaints that were made and then things start to hit the hit the fan and i think the other um aspect was immediately sesame went well, out immediately but after the it started getting more hot right started gaining some momentum then they automatically came out without even identifying who the uh the mascot is what their ethnicity is they they went into oh we we we're gonna have conduct employee you know, right. bias trained. You know what I mean? Like you, you, you jumped to that, right? Yeah, we right. were already kind of speculating, be based off the video and off the footage, but now it's almost to a certain extent they confirmed, or at least are kind of going along with that. Like, oh, we're, they're going to go through discrimination training and and diversity and bias training and all these other different things, right? Where you could have just been, well, this wasn't the case, blah blah blah. And I don't know as far as terms of confidentiality, as far as what they're able to. Um, you know, relay to the public regarding who the person is and things of that nature and protecting identity and so on and so forth. Um, what I will say is that, Jay, I've been to a lot of theme parks um, and Sesame Place, just kind of going back, um, just kind of thinking back, you see a lot of personalities there. 
And right. what I'm going to say is that we're very fortunate, especially this particular character. I'm, just, I'm keeping it a thousand percent, right? We're very, this, this mascot is very fortunate that the fact that they disrespected this particular family that was well-mannered, level-headed, and handled the situation in the, the healthy manner, like the manner that they should have as far as bringing it to the park and then seeking other different resources and, and, and having it become, um, you know, available to the media and so forth. For the reason that if they would have got another parent, and you know what I'm right. talking about. Like, I've seen other person, I've seen different parenting styles. I'm just going to say that, right? <laughs> <laughs> I've seen some folks that handle things differently. And they're very fortunate that, that they didn't get that other family or that other that other parent that saw you no, I, that to the kid. I'm going to be know honest you, with you. Because listen, I, mean, I know what you're saying, man. Right, because you know what? As a parent, you immediately are one upset i mean you're hurt but then it turns into anger and frustration right because now you're not you're not rejecting me you're not disrespecting me you're disrespecting my child and the fact is then i go see you hug another kid so sometimes that immediate or that instant emotion or that thought which goes into the emotion and now the behavior is like oh i gotta do something you know this isn't good i'm not allowed to stand i'm just gonna say very fortunate that they got those particular parents, and I'm happy that they are because they handled it in a healthier manner. Um, that they didn't get the other one because that could have turned into a whole different situation. Yeah, I mean, it, listen, it could have went bad. Um, but again, like my my focus is just on like when you go somewhere like that, um, people are paying a lot of money for an experience, right? Absolutely. Parking is expensive. The park parking is expensive. The food is expensive. You know, the the the, the ticket is expensive. And people pay for that experience, right? Um, and you got to take the time and give every kid that experience. So, again, does it look racial? You know, yeah, definitely from the outside. Um, and they kind of claim responsibility, so I can't let them off the hook. Um, but, you know, again, the way you really see real change is, you know, what you see some people pushing for, and that's people saying, don't spend your money there until you kind of are satisfied with the, uh, changes they're gonna make so we'll leave it there there you go uh so yeah we'll continue to monitor um see how this story develops and uh we'll go from there all right so now to other um jay you you mentioned uh you said uh i, I remember was it last week well i don't i don't know if we were uh if we were recording or not but we were talking about like how it's become what did you you mentioned the okay the uh the, the the okay corral how it used to be back in the day right i was just been it's told folks are out there for the sound yeah. the, the violence and just the aggressive behavior is at an all-time high and um this i think is is a, is a perfect example of that so um a few days ago um bishop lamar whitehead who is um who has a a church in uh in Brooklyn, Brooklyn, New York. Unfortunately, he and his congregation were robbed at gunpoint in the middle of a sermon that he was facilitating. All right. So he was about five to ten minutes into the sermon, and he said he saw the door in the back of the room get kicked open. And he said like three to four men walked in with guns. And he said, um, you can see, and also this was caught on camera because he was live streaming it. So mm -hmm. all of this was recorded and he, uh, or at least from the angle that you see is him in front giving the sermon. You can see his reaction to what's taking place. And then you see one, one of the assailants um, pointing a gun at him. And so he, as he describes it, he said, uh, after they busted in, he said, he got down. He said one, he got down on the floor. One went to his wife and took all her jewelry. Uh, he said that one un had a gun in front of his eight-month-year-old baby's face. He said one took off his uh, his bishop's ring, his wedding band, his chain, and then were was checking for his chains that were underneath his robe and started like kind of like tapping his neck and to see if he had anything else. He said so that means that they knew they watched um, and they knew that I had other jewelry. He said what you don't see on camera is that. Um, he had about 
a hundred um, other individuals that were in the room. He had his congregation who uh, were also in the room and that they were going through and taking their items also. So uh, what he said, he said, my church is traumatized. The women and children are still crying. They're still um, heavily reacting to the, to the issue or to the incident. He said, he said, these men need to turn themselves in. I forgive you. I'm praying for you. I hope that God delivers you from the mindset of who you are at this time. Now, Bishop Whitehead believed that his family was targeted um, because of the publicity that he received when he helped turn in the suspect that was wanted in the fatal subway shooting of uh, 48-year-old Daniel Enriquez back in May a couple months ago. He said, I turned him in, but the media called me the bling bling bishop. He said they had my Rolls Royce all over, all over TV and everywhere. I feel that that played a part in this. Um, I think that all the pastors should be should be able to get permits for pistols. Um, and the, per the New York Times, the police said that the attackers had made off with approximately $1 million worth of jewelry. All right. So in the aftermath of this, there have been a lot of different comments. There's been a lot of different perspectives. There have been a lot of just different opinions that have been like on social media and on websites. So you have had a lot of people talking about, well, why does he have $1 million in jewelry in the first place? Uh, you have other people that are of his, you know, on his side or of his perspective and saying that, yeah, you know what? People should start, or especially like clergymen should start carrying pistols in the church. Um, you know, just a variety of other different things. And, you know, what I thought of immediately, I don't know if you remember this, Jay, back when, um, and we're going to, sh I'm showing my age on this one. Uh, you remember when AI was uh, was first drafted, right? And when he, he went to, he was in court for something. I don't remember what the legal charges were. But I remember, like, he was sitting in the courtroom, right? And the Daily News had him on, like, had a picture of him sitting in the courtroom. And they had like all these other different, um, they had like all these taglines to the jewelry that he was wearing. And they had like prices. They had like literally how much worth of jewelry he was like just sitting in the courtroom. Um, now mind you, he's sitting there for a legal matter, right? For a court right. proceeding. But they like the, had it like on the front of the daily news that like, they had all the items of jewelry that they held on and what it was worth and things. And so like just kind of thinking about uh, you know, the bling bling bishop and the Rolls Royce and all these other different things um, kind of just immediately had me flash back to that. Um, but now this is, this is the okay corral, man. This is, um, I think, I, I don't know. I think once upon a time, I thought there were certain places and certain people that were off limits. You right. know I mean? Crime has been around for years. You know, you know, you and I, we all know it's very prevalent. Um, in these neighborhoods, unfortunately. However, there used to be, at least I thought there were, not to say that I was, you know, participating in that life, but I thought there was a um, kind of an honor amongst type of and rules and regulations, checks and balances, whatever terminology you want to use, um, of like just certain places that what you, you didn't rob, right? Certain people, certain individuals, certain institutions um, you have respect for and that you didn't go after apparently not right? right um again similar to sesame place to a certain extent you have people that are going there for a place of worship so you have individuals that are just there trying to get the daily word trying to get their you know religious and spiritual fulfillment fulfillment and this takes place right so again safe havens right if any place you think you should be able to go to it's church. It's your place of worship. And when that is threatened, it just rocks you to the core. Um, and it's, un it's unfortunate um, just for, for his family, for his congregation to experience. So I can only imagine the, you know, the trauma and the aftermath that they're experiencing. Uh, so absolutely my thoughts and prayers and well wishes go to them as they are on the road to recovery. But um, this is, you know, it just rocks you because of like, there are certain places that you used to think were off limits and apparently not. I, listen, man. Um, all right. This is crazy because to me, because when I first looked, 
you know, I thought this when I first heard of this, I thought the same thing as you, right? I was thinking like, well, like we have big problems, right? Because how can you have a community, any community anywhere where where people don't respect something, right? Like what's next? Like robbing old ladies? Respectfully, like we've had we've been having this conversation over and over, right? And it kind of comes down to fundamentally like man's inhumanity to man, right? Because again, there used to be a time when if you was running around like it's the okay corral, you was doing that to people that was in the same game as you and taking the same risks as you. You wasn't robbing a, a, the, the man that worked at, at the mall. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm not condoning any of it, but what I'm saying is we've gotten to the point, right? Where there are no lines, right? Um, the other part, so th that lack of compassion, I mean, we have a bunch of, you know, um, examples of that. You know, obviously the Sesame Place one is a less extreme example, but we're talking about, when we talk about like safe spaces and all, I don't know if you remember, it was a story about a year and a half ago, maybe it was like a dude that beat up two women in front of his kids in Great Adventure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, was, it was crazy, you know, you know what I'm saying? Right. Um, and you would never think bringing your family to great adventure, that's what you would see, right? So to get back to this, um, again, think about all the people that their experience in church will never be the same before. Uh, I mean, again, right? Like mm -hmm. for some people, church is a place that they go, they feel like they're part of a family, right? They feel like they're going there to get renewed, right? They feel like <clears throat> they're going there and to be safe, and be free, right? With people that they're comfortable with. And from forever, right? They're gonna be anxious because every time the door opens and back up, right? Um, so the vicarious trauma, which we was talking about, that's real. I, I think the other part of it, cause I read the comments from people and all of that. Again, maybe that's a, another conversation for another day cause it's multi-layered, right? But I would say this, right? I don't even think this was a mega church, right? He said he had a hundred people there, right? So, so this is not TD Jakes, and this is not Joel Osteen, who who's riding around a sixty million dollar jet, right? What I and, and I would take it even farther. I don't even judge them, right? Because they are wealthy through their parishioners they're in their congregation right. right and if their congregation is not voting in them out of that position if their congregation continues to enrich them year a uh, week after week if his congregation continues to give him money why would anybody be be that upset about him getting that salary right again it might be another conversation for another day but Again, I can't rush to judgment and say, oh, he was just waving me in front of walls, right? Because I don't know that 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 he that he didn't make his wealth somewhere else. When I saw commercials of this guy on um, on Instagram, yeah, he was in a Rolls Royce, yeah, he was in a Lambo truck, but he was talking about like buildings that he owned and flipping properties. And we're talking about a hundred member church. That's not a mega church. So nobody said that he was getting rich and enriched himself off these people, right? Um, and I think when people throw that out there, like, yeah, he had on a Fendi jacket. Yeah, he had on all these jewels. Yeah, he has on a Gucci jacket. If he made that money as a businessman, it ain't of nobody's business is what he's doing. And if his congregation is fine with it, then these, remember, let's remember, like, and again, our mind, we like to conflate things, right? We want to make it okay that somebody got robbed on television, right? So maybe they were being too flash, right? But remember, it's not like one of his congregation robbed him. I, I, I'm willing to bet all the money in my pocket that the people that robbed him never sat a day on his pew. So their beef with him was not him being flashy. He was just a mark. In, in, in an easy one. So what we're really talking about is, are you comfortable with people bringing guns into soft targets like that? Safe spaces, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to consider all of that when we say, 
you know, oh, well, you know, you know, I ain't got a Lambo truck. So, you know, because that's most people when it, when that, you know, the, the, the first thought is that, oh, he's in Brooklyn. He got on chains. He got a Lambo truck. Why he got all of that? He shouldn't have anything. You know, you know what I'm saying? So I think that's a separate conversation, but you know, I, I, I would much rather deal with the lack of compassion for another person and the vicarious trauma, you know, uh, part of it. Um, and listen, man, that's man's inhumanity to man, but it's becoming more common. And it, I mean, obviously it's, you know, despicable behavior, but it's yeah, crazy. And, and that's, that's, the, um, that's the sad part uh, where you have individuals that have experienced this traumatic, right? This, just this, I, I mean, I, I can't, like, again, I, I can't put it, I can't fathom that. Like, just thinking back when you and I ever went to church and just imagining that happen. And it's that lack of empathy, unfortunately, that people tend to have when these situations take place and they kind of dehumanize because they're completely over analyzing and paying attention to the disposition aspect of it as opposed to looking at the situation right this person's up there and he's trying to give a sermon doesn't matter whatever whatever his salary is whatever he drives or whatever the situation it's more of like oh well well these people are you know it's justified for this congregation for this man for his family for them they have gotten robbed because of whatever he's pushing right whatever material items that you see and we unfortunately um, just, I'm not going to just say any particular community, but, um, just as humans, generally you're starting to see that more and more frequently that when these things happen and it's, whether it's coming from a place of jealousy, where it's coming from a place of hate, where it's just coming from a place, you're just total lack of empathy, totally dehumanizing what this person has experienced and just like, oh, well, because they have that, well, you know, there you go. They, they can afford it. They can lose it. Why do they have that in the first place? So now you're victim blaming the, you know, to be the individuals that have just experienced a severe traumatic, you know, situation. Yo, I saw a similar situation happen when Pop Smoke got killed, right? Because here you got a kid, right? Young rapper. He works hard to get himself in a position where he's a superstar, right? Where the next generation is, is looking to him to be the next one, right? He goes to L.A., in, in part of him being welcome to LA and being out there and working on his album, all of the big designers out there are sending him gifts. He's celebrating, you know, obviously his success, showing the gifts, unboxing, doing what a lot of people do on the internet, right? And shows his address by accident. They come to his house, kill him, right? right. And instead of focusing on the people now he didn't steal any of these gifts he worked for all of that that's his stuff the fact if he worked and he's more successful than you me or anybody else that's our problem to deal with it's not his problem right and i don't believe in a world i don't live in a world and i don't live a life where i think people should have to hide their success or their intelligence for your bruised ego i just don't feel that way if somebody makes 10 million dollars and they can afford to drive a Ferrari, and you got to pull up in your Honda Accord, then if you should look at it as motivation, you know, to work, you know, jealousy is a weak emotion. Jay-Z gave it to us a long time ago, right? So again, I'm not saying that that every single person who's, who's wealthy has earned it, but the people that we're talking about, okay, we don't know that they were just born with silver spoons in their mouth, right? And, and again, I don't live in a world where somebody should have to hide their wealth when they, when they work for something. So the reason why I draw, you know, kind of analogies to that is because, you know, people are quick to say, well, he deserved that because he has so much. And I, and I just think that that's a very weak perspective to, to, to subscribe to because you're, you're only going to find people doing that who haven't achieved that level of success yet. You know what I mean? Um, and it's, it's just kind of... I don't know, you know, it's, it's, what, what does that say to um, the hope people have for themselves, right? Like, cause I, I'm not, to success to everybody isn't money, right? So it doesn't have to be necessarily money, um, but 
again, I don't think that somebody should have to hide their success. And, and again, if his, you know, congregation is okay with it, you know, and they're not robbing them, <laughs> then why should we, we be upset? But again, that's my, that's just my opinion. Yeah, I mean, I'll end on this. It, it, it further, it's a, it's a divisive form of thinking, right? Because it further divides, oh, well, this person has and we don't. So it's okay if these type of unfortunate events take place to them. They got it, you know, or they shouldn't have it. So this is what happens. When, and all that does is reinforce more aggressive behavior towards these particular type of individuals, right? Whether, again, it's not our business of how they came into whatever their fortune is or whatever their possessions and items are. However, it reinforces that same type of aggressive us versus them, the have versus the have nots. And it's okay for, you know what, I'm gonna run up on them and I'm gonna do whatever I want. It's okay that they got robbed. It's okay that these things happen, right? So this is what reinforces that type of behavior and it justifies individuals like that. They feel like, yeah, you know what? We did that because, you know, they can afford it, X, Y, and Z. And so um, it, that's, it's just an unfortunate form of thinking, man. It's a, it's a lack of empathy. And again, my, you know, my heart goes out to him and his congregation and his family. Because uh, this is, you know, again, we talk about the trauma that people experience. And this is, this is it. Like, you have these individuals that are going to have to hopefully seek some form of support and therapy for what they experienced in the church. It's crazy, man. <laughs> you know, now, again, I, I just think, you know, now, whether or not, whether you look at Pop Smoke situation, whether you look at him, you know, how he dresses and presents himself in that community, in the church, whether whether that's poor decision making, you know, again, that's a separate conversation. But again, it's not a justification for what they observed and what happened to each one of them. So, you know, absolutely not. And you know what else is not a justification, which is there's no justification for any of this type of behavior is when you have a therapist taking taking an advantage of a of a client. All right. We're about to get yeah. this story. All right. So recently. A therapist, a Lincoln therapist, a uh, Lincoln therapist and drug and alcohol counselor has had her mental health practitioner license revoked over allegations that she befriended a client and took thousands in cash and trips from her. All right. So Jessica Stoli, she is the owner of Zen I hope I'm saying that right. But if, you know, if I'm not, oh, well, because she's facing criminal charges for taking advantage of a client. All right. So though she was sued last year uh, by a Lincoln couple over the same allegations, uh, she it was part of a, um, a plea bargain that she was able to waive and get through. But I'm going to go over this particular situation that we're, we're talking about. All right. So the allegations involve a former client of Stoley's who told the Department of Health and Human Services investigator that she sought therapy in, two, in March of 2019 after experiencing a panic attack and saw Ms. Stoli for about two months. Soon after starting therapy, Stoli began texting her and they began spending personal time together, sharing meals, shopping, and traveling together, all right? She told the investigator that the summer that Stoli asked her for money due to financial difficulty. At Stoli's request, she said she opened up a joint checking account with her and transferred the money to her on multiple occasions. She said that they used, she, she, she mentioned that Stoli used the money in the account for trips to New York and Washington, D.C. for them both and for a trip for her and two members of Stoli's family and her friend to go to Belize. She said the former client paid Stoli to go to, salon, to the salon and more than $13,000 in costs associated with intended purchases of a home in Maryland for their shared use. All right. So in November of that year, months after she had stopped seeing her for counseling, I mean, for counseling, Stoli then asked her to, to, uh, to backdate a two year life coaching agreement that called for fees of $120 per hour up to three hours, $575 for half day sessions and $975 for full day sessions and $600 per day for travel plus airfare and hotel accommodations. Mm -hmm. All right. So, uh, yeah, Jay. Uh, so right off the bat, this is 
a prime and extreme example of multiple relationships. All right. Oh yeah. All right. This this is what this is. All right. Standard in our handbook of Essex, standard three point zero five. Okay. <laughs> they said we clinicians refrain from an entering in multiple relationship with a client. All right. Now that's just us as psychologists. Now right. she's a counselor. I don't know. I imagine that they have something similar in their code of ethics. Okay. However, again, this is a prime example of multiple relationships, dual relationships, whatever, um, you know, is uh, in their, their code of ethics for the reason of exploitation, right? This is the way you run the risk of exploiting someone that comes to you, a client or a patient that comes to you and they're in a vulnerable position due to whatever they're experiencing, right? They're going through something in their life that they're coming to seek treatment from you, okay? And this person took it upon themselves to exploit that relationship in multiple ways over multiple months and just totally take advantage of this individual. Um, and it's... I mean, this is this is the stuff that again gives any type of mental health clinician that black eye, right? This is what you know. You see, like um, movies and things that are made out of this, like television series. This, this is, <laughs> it is like I, I'm trying to think of because there's actually a series, Jay. Um, it's with Will Ferrell and Paul Rudd, where it was something very similar to this that was based on a true story. Um, but this this just paints a picture. This exemplifies how much influence um, we as clinicians have, especially with individuals that are in a vulnerable situation, right? They're in a vulnerable time in their life and absolutely depending on the severity and what other different um, issues that are taking place can fall victim. Like this is predatory behavior on, on behalf of this person. Uh, it is, it is. I gotta call it what it is, man. Like this, like, did you, you heard how much money she was Yo, getting from this person, brother? Like taking I mean, clips, I, like this is this this is outrageous. Listen, I don't really have much to say about this. I mean, I just kind of wanted to bring it up because it's such a it's such like an absurd example, um, an extreme example. Um, you would hope this doesn't happen frequently, but it's <laughs> honestly it's an example of stupidity, right? Because what did she think was going to happen? This is just the stupidity at, at its finest, right? Um, borrowing money for trips, 13 G's, bro, and home improvements. Um, you know, it seemed like she kind of, but from the design of the whole place, it seemed like she had a license for therapy, but she was like combining it with like life skills stuff and like mindfulness stuff. Um, so it, it seemed like she had a nice little pyramid scheme kind of going kind of thing going on. Wow. Um, but again, I think the interesting fact is, you know, you you know this obviously, um, the statistics, you know, will kind of tell you that people that commit boundary crossings in general, these type of ones, sexual ones, et cetera, you know, they have a history of doing, of engaging in that behavior before. And as the article says, she's being sued by another couple for doing the same thing, right? So, um, if anything, you know, if, if there's anybody listening who happens to be on the other side of the table and is a patient, um, this is why th this is the extreme end, right? But the beginning kind of end of this is therapists or counselors who are kind of too much more interested in being your friend, <laughs> um, you know, than having to focus on therapy, right? Um, and again, I'm not saying that every therapist that has that style will end up crossing a boundary, um, you know, but again, from personal experience, like there are many people who are still sitting in my inbox with friends requests, right? <laughs> from years ago, right? Who were my patients. And it's not like, I mean, plenty of them want to hang out. You know, some of them, honestly, if it was a different time, different circumstance, we, you know, we might be able to paint the town red together, but Right. Um, it's just not appropriate because of the relationship um, and because of the power differential 
um, and the likelihood that may, they might need treatment, you know, moving forward. So I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but it's just interesting to see because you don't think that you, they make people this dumb, you know, but they do. You know? no, yeah, it's, it's, you know, um, it's unfortunate where you have an individual and again, I, I'm, I'm the word you're, you're preying on somebody. You're preying on somebody's weakness. You're preying on somebody's vulnerability. Um, and it's just unfortunate. And for those that are on the other end, a client, um, if you're listening to this, absolutely, you know, is paying attention to those particular red flags. Like there shouldn't be any reason why your therapist, your psychologist, your clinician or whomever, um, should be calling you and asking for money for any reason, right. unless you miss the payment for the session or they're calling you to say, Hey, we have to reschedule. Other than that, there's no reason why a, your clinician should be calling you and asking you to hang out. <laughs> That's not how it works. And no you definitely, treatment shouldn't plan. Be giving them, definitely shouldn't be giving them 13 G's. Yeah. You, they shouldn't be soliciting you for money. Okay outside of what the session cost is. So these are red flags. And I know there are some individuals that, you know, you have a great relationship. The goal is to have a great therapeutic rapport and bond with your clinician and also between, you know, clinician and client, right? That, that is the absolute goal for the reason that growth can take place, transparency, information can be shared, all of the whole, everything. Right. However, let me reiterate, there's no reason on God's green earth that your therapist or your clinician or psychologist should be calling you and asking you, let's go hang out at the mall. Let's go get something to eat. Let's go do all these other different things. All right. Absolutely crossing boundaries. And if that happens, okay, that's a red flag. Okay. Right. And so feel free to call them out. Also remember that Jay and I, like we've talked about previously, you know, this is a collaborative relationship between a client and a clinician. So you should feel every right to say, hey, I don't feel comfortable with this. And if it don't feel good, absolutely listen to your gut and call them on that. And feel free to discontinue, you know, uh, service with this individual. If they're calling and asking you to do things that you feel uncomfortable with, this goes beyond challenging your client within the confounds of treatment, right? right. So, um, yeah, uh, it's it just unfortunate when you have individuals that take advantage of um, of their title, of their training, um, and like you said, of that power differential that, that exists in the relationship. So, uh, yeah, that, that's this is bad stuff, very bad stuff. So, um, yeah, we'll see. Yeah, hey, interesting, right. though. Interesting story, though. Yeah, yeah, man, it's, you don't think stuff... People like this exist that are gonna prey upon folks, man. But yeah, you know, uh, uh. all right. So on to some research. All right, and it turns out, Jay, that depression may not be likely caused by a chemical imbalance. All right. So a recent review, uh, a recent review study uh, is pushing back against the long-held views in medicine that depression is caused by, uh, by a serotonin imbalance in the brain. So researchers at University College London conducted a umbrella review of the past meta-studies and systemic an analysis of depression's relationship to serotonin activity that includes tens of thousands of participants. So the study was published recently in the Journal of Molecular Psychiatry, and it concluded that there's no evidence that serotonin levels or serotonin activity is responsible for depression. So just as a little big, uh, some background information. For, serotonin is a neurotransmitter that plays a key role in governing mood, sleep, digestion, and other body functions. And for years, a chemical imbalance of serotonin has been widely uh, viewed as a culprit of depression or for depression, resulting in widespread use of antidepressants, all right, which boosts serotonin in, in the brain. So researchers say that this review calls into question the basis for the use of antidepressants. All right, so Jay, given this new information, what's your take on that? What do you think? All right, listen, um, it's an interesting study, right? Mm -hmm. 
Um, but people have to be careful not to jump the gun. They have to really be careful how they consume research and make sure they consume it the right way. So you got to know what the study is saying and what it's not saying, right? And then you got to know the foundation, right? So there are multiple hypotheses, you know, explanations to explain in major depression, you know, serotonin levels or decreased serotonin activity was one of them. Um, again, the monoamine hypothesis focuses, you know, on serotonin, neuroepinephrine, and dopamine, right? The catecholamine hypothesis focuses on norepinephrine. Stress diathesis uh, theory hypothesis focuses on stress and vulnerability, right? And, and genetic uh, vulnerability. So if, even if this is absolutely correct, if we work in a world where this is absolutely correct, right? There's still the three hypotheses that I mentioned that it doesn't address, right? So I'm not saying it's not, it's wrong, right? But we've always viewed depression as having these multiple explanations, right? Yeah. These are hypotheses, right? Um, so you can't jump the gun because again, I know that the tendency for people is gonna be jump the gun to say, oh, well, all the information is wrong, right? And why are we using antidepressants, right? And that's why I said, it's important that we look at how we consume research and read it the right way, right? Because what the study did not review, right, is the efficacy of antidepressants, right? Um, so, so this is the thing. When you read the study, the researchers were basically saying that they were taught the same way we were taught, right? That mm -hmm. this was the explanation, right? Um, and that their main concern wasn't even really that because they understand all these other hypotheses the way, same way we do. Their main concern was that patients and the general public in general has been led to believe through like a public campaign, right? That serotonin levels are directly related to, to major depression diagnoses. And that in turn is making people more acceptable of taking major uh, antidepressants as medication. That's totally different than saying we, we've been wrong all this time, right? Because what they were not saying and what they didn't say is that SSRIs, TCAs, and MAOIAs are not the most effective way to relieve depressive symptoms, right? Mm -hmm. They didn't say that because that's not true, right? Um, along with CBT or what else, whatever. So we have to look at, you know, you know what, I, what I'm getting at, brother. Like it's important information, it's good information. It's an interesting article, you know, um, but we have to look at what it is saying and what it is not saying, right? Because it does, it's not gonna change your answers or my answers on the licensing exam, I'll tell you that. I think we also absolutely have to be careful for the reason that you know and I know in any article, it's the headline that gets you to, that grabs you. Right, right, so right. The headline says what? <laughs> chemical imbalance, right? <laughs> There's no longer a chemical imbalance. Serotonin, no longer a chemical imbalance. It doesn't, it doesn't cause depression, it doesn't contribute to depression. And so immediately because chemical imbalance is one of those terms, one of those buzz phrases that have been used for such a long period of time, it's automatically gonna draw people to reading this article, which they should. It's an important article to read. It's always important as right. more information is coming out, right? You wanna continue to advance and get more information, especially as it pertains to mental health and uh, the physiological aspect of, of things. However, right, for them to just say, oh, well, it's no longer a chemical imbalance, that again, it's misleading for the reason that we also know that serotonin is not the only neurotransmitter that's involved <laughs> <laughs> with that contributes to depression or something that we long believe and study. It's not the only neurotransmitter that contributes to depression. Yes, it, you know, serotonin is one of the more widely known and more popular because yes, it, you know, it affects your mood, hunger, arousal, all these other different things, right? That's what we know serotonin does. However, you also have um, neuropinephrine, which is also a neurotransmitter, which also um, is an important role as it relates to mood, attention, and also can contribute to some forms of depression, right? So, so you can't just say, all right, well, because we did this, we went back and reviewed these studies and these meta-analysis 
serotonin is no longer a situation, right? It's no longer contributes. You can't say that because that's irresponsible, right? It's good to get information and say, okay, we're, we're taking another look at this, right? At this information, which we should. We should continue to review this. But you have to be very careful in regards to just saying it's no longer a chemical balance. Because now, if you say that general statement, now you're just thinking that, well, there is no, you know, um, there's no physiological aspect as it pertains to neurotransmitters that are contributing to depression, right? And we just know that just, that's not study. That's not just so. We know that to be to be the case, but absolutely getting some more information. Um, and so even with that, you have to also take a look, like you mentioned, medication, right? There's a reason why SSRIs have proven to be effective. It's not all just the placebo effect, right? It can't be that, right? So we, there's... All, tons and tons of research trials and even uh that we've seen clients getting better on this particular medication so yeah absolutely you're gonna have to tease out and start you know looking at various components of this particular treatment if we're going to look at ssris and just looking and isolating serotonin to see okay what else is going on here was there something that we missed is there some additional information so I think that's the part that jumped out of me was the, just the, the blanket statement of, oh, and there's no, a chemical imbalance is not no longer the case. Like, all right, guys, we can't <laughs> slow down. That, I mean, listen, that's how you get the headline, but that's why I've said it's important to look at what they did, right? What they, what they concluded and what they really, what they really concluded was they're really just theorizing about a, the cause, right? right? So they're theorizing about the cause you know, and they're trying to rule something out, fine. Um, so that's one part of what they're doing. The second part of why they have this type of attention grabbing headline is because they, they're trying to draw some attention to the fact that they feel like it's not right. You know, that the, the, the consensus amongst a lot of the customers, the people that are prescribed this um, and the general public is that it's serotonin. You know, um, and I get it, right? Because, um, you know, we kind of understand a little bit more of the intricacies and below the surface kind of stuff. Um, but again, I think a lot, I think people should read this article. I think it's interesting. I think it contributes to what we know um, and it adds a lot. Um, but again, didn't review the efficacy of antidepressants, that's very important. Um, and what it's not saying, is that antidepressants aren't one of the most effective ways to alleviate those symptoms. So you got to remember that. Yes, absolutely. So, but yeah, um, I agree. Absolutely going to be something I'm going to continue to read up on and see as their future studies continue to develop because I, it's in our, especially in our line of work, we absolutely need to uh, stay up on the evolving field and on the jargon and all just other uh, research. All right. So University of College London has been getting busy, all right? So they had this study and they also recently um, brought to the, to the forefront that postpartum depression or depression with postpartum onset, whichever, however you would like to phrase it, uh, apparently can hit both mom and dad, sometimes at the same time, all right? So the researchers at the University College of London looked at 23 past studies with data from more than 29,000 couples. The research team found that about three in every 100 couples experienced late postpartum depression when their child was three to 12 months years old. And for about two in every 100, 100 couples, both parents had um, antenatal depression, which means before the child's birth, and early postpartum depression, meaning up to 12 weeks after birth. Other research showed that uh, about 10% of fathers experienced depression during their partner's pregnancy and around 9% in the first po um, postnatal year. And so uh, the review included studies from about 15 countries. And one limitation is that the countries use a variety of different screening tools. OK, so that was one of the limitations that they mentioned in the study. Um, so. What I'm going to say, Jay, is that uh, this is not shocking to me uh, for the reason that, I mean, depending on, I guess, on the 
uh, the family makeup or the system or the couple situation prior to the kids um, or prior to birth. Yeah, absolutely. There's, and also let me put this out. Let me preface this, all right? Because I don't want to say like the men or the dads are going through the same thing that moms are because we are not, okay? Absolutely not. There's a whole, there's a whole nother lane that mom is experiencing that I think men will never ever fully comprehend or understand. Um, however, at the same time, um, no, dads absolutely experience um, a reaction. And whether it be the postpartum depression, whether it be anxiety, there's just so much that goes into the whole childbirth, pregnancy, raising an infant uh, or a newborn, that whole process. It's just, it's so much going on. It's so multifaceted and so, so many different levels um, that mom is going through. And at the same time, dad is experiencing it also because again, there's a lot of unknowns going through the part. So them saying that, um, that both parents had antenatal um, depression absolutely makes sense to me. You know, right. I, I would have thought the number would have been higher than, than two in every hundred couples for the reason that there's just so many unknowns, the process, the back and forth um, with the prenatal appointments and the um, anyone that knows that's going through the process, the closer and closer you get to the delivery date, you're going more and more frequently. Uh, there are so many other different things that are taking place. It's a very, very stressful period, just to say the least. So, um, and yeah, and especially, you know, you're more at risk, of course, if you already have a history of depression or anxiety um, preceding the, the, the pregnancy um, process or portion. So um, yeah, there's a lot of unknowns, it's a very stressful period. So absolutely, I can see this taking place for the reason that you're getting both parents, depending on their involvement, are receiving a lot of information and a lot of it is unknown. So the unknown, as you know, you not you and I have, have told our clients is a scary place to be at. And especially when you're talking about human life, yeah, um, things are gonna fluctuate. So I would have thought the number was gonna be higher, but yeah, um, totally, yeah. It, it, and this is good information also. Uh, this is good information for both mom and dad to happen, right? Because the, the whole goal is to normalize this, right? It's to normalize and educate that, yeah, there are going to be some changes in your mood. There are going to be some changes uh, in your thought process as you go through this. So I think this is a good article that I think should absolutely get more, um, I hope gain some momentum and I, it absolutely should be publicized more so mom and dad both know this. Um, I mean, listen, I, I mean, I know the, you know, the numbers on moms, you know, postpartum. Um, uh, so again, I think it's up to 20%, something like that. Um, I, I thought this was interesting because I had never really heard, read about dads. I didn't even know they could really get postpartum. Oh, yeah. Um, maybe it had been mentioned before, but I didn't really remember it, not really spoke about much. Um, I looked at this a little different perspective. I thought it was interesting because they talked about um, the association of paternal depression like with maternal depression, right? So they were kind of talking about how each person impacts each other, right? Um, and how it increases the risk by three times, you know, of dad developing if mom has, right? Um, and, and it got me thinking because they talked about, they said something in this article and they said, um, they were talking about stress and support and major depression of both parties. And they said the focus on the relationship between each of the parents is important to each other's mental health, right? And that kind of got me to thinking like people need to be conscious of this when they're picking somebody to have children with, right? Because, you know, again, you know, there are people, you know, who have kind of like, a very lackadaisical attitude about who they pick to, to co-parent with or who they pick to have children with. And these are factors that you got to think about when, you, when we're talking about support or stress, right? Or um, what that does to the baby potentially, right? Um, 
because all of these factors are going to contribute to somebody developing postpartum, whether it's mom or dad, right? Um, I'm sure you're going to be less likely to develop it if you're in a supportive, loving relationship, you know, where you can kind of express some of those feelings if you have them appropriately than if you're alone, unsupported, and in a tumultuous relationship, you know? Um, so these are other things that people need to think about because, you know, some people may not even recognize that they have postpartum, right? Because they were talking about it extending from three months up to a year, right? So you may keep, think people that did, that you may have people thinking they're just in a bad relationship, you know, or just having bad feelings when they're really experiencing postpartum, right? Um, but if you're in a situationship, relationship, co-parenting with somebody that, you know, you can't communicate as effectively with, it's gonna increase your stress, it's gonna increase the likelihood that you experienced it. So um, you gotta be careful who you select. And, and man, let me tell you this, all right, bro. They have the word distress in this article. That's an understatement, all right? Like, listen, it's even even with like trying to be as selective and hopefully you're with somebody that is going to be supportive throughout the whole situation. It's just such a um, a stressful period, man. Like, I wish they had another word for stress when you go through as far as like the pregnancy process and just like having a kid afterwards. Um, because even as much support that you have, and you mentioned it earlier, a lot of, in particularly mothers, don't know what that, the, that postpartum depression or those symptoms are going to look like because it varies, right? It vacillates. It, I mean, it, it waxes and wanes. It's, it, sometimes it does, it's not like how it is on TV, right? It's not always like the excessive crying. It's not always just like it hits you. Right. It'll come in so many different ways or in so many different phases. And because it's so individualized, um, a lot of individuals don't know that, that they're experiencing symptom of postpartum. And so, again, I can only speak from, from dad's point of view. And again, mine was even a different circumstance because I had mine young, right? I'm young. I'm fresh out of high school having having a kid but a lot of dads and i think some people will agree with me is that you take your cue from mom and that's even if you're having a healthy kid like immediately following when the baby's young and they're not sleeping and all that's when it kicks in and you like you were on your own and so a lot of times you're taking your cue from what mom is going through Right, because you want to try to be as supportive, but if mom is struggling because the baby and all those different things that are happening along like with these other environmental factors are taking place, shit goes off the rails real quick, bro. And you're stressed out because mom's stressed out, and it's a feeling of helplessness because you're trying to support, and whatever you're doing is not working, yeah, whatever right. she's doing is not working. Like the baby won't go down. The bit is like it, it's so many different things. So that's why I can totally um, understand where they say they go through it at the same time, because even in the most supportive situation, everything that's taking place, especially with mom, is going through the physiological change, the mental, you know, mind state change. Everything that's taking place, um, it's just like that feeling of helplessness, and I think that's what overcomes. Um, and what's so overwhelming for mom and dad is that you're just helpless, right? You got this little kid that's crying, you got this other different things, or nothing's going right, and you're at you're at a stand, you're at a standstill, and nothing's working. Um, it's tough. So, absolutely, hopefully, people become more educated on not just some of the things that they talk about in the, in the what to expect when inspecting but getting more about what postpartum looks like, you know, before and after and taking into consideration, like, Hey, what does your history look like? Like you talked about, because that's a, a huge influencer. And uh, yeah, man, it's, um, it's rough, man. And I mean, again, it is, it's a great event to have a child, to have a baby, wonderful, it's a blessing, so on and so forth. However, it's, it's about as distressing as things are going to get for you. Uh, I can take it, man. You know, so, um, but yeah, this is a good article. I hope this gets, you know, publicized more. It was in the, uh, the U.S. News article, and I hope it gets out there and, and individuals become more educated about this because this, 
Oof. It's, it's, a, it's a tough period, bro. Tough yeah, period. Man. I was I was getting yelled at. I didn't know what was going on. You see what I mean? I was, I was like, I got, okay. I, well, did you did you try this? No, nah, listen, bro. <laughs> 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 Terrible, bro. I didn't know what I was doing. Um, anything else before we get out of here, Jay? Nah, man. Just of course, want to thank everybody that takes the time to listen. Um, you know, appreciate it. Uh, um, you know, we're gonna keep it up with the content. You know, just hope everybody enjoys their week. You know, and make sure you prioritize your mental health. Absolutely. Um, also. Continue to provide feedback. If you guys have any thoughts or ideas, you know, the email is still the same. Um, you know, black psychologist podcast and gmail.com. Even when you're uh, leaving comments in, on YouTube or any other platform, hey, you know, there's a topic you guys want us to uh, discuss or review or cover, let us know. You know, Jay and I are for the people. Hmm. All right. That's how we roll. All right. So let us know and we'll cover it. Cause that's what we do. That's how we roll. All right. Jay, until next time, good brother. All right, no doubt, bro. Have All a right. good one, man.